Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today we have a discussion that I've been thinking of doing for quite some time, and it centers on the structure of the Wano arc and what I think we can comfortably expect for the future. And this isn't an entirely new discussion at all. I feel like I bring it up a fair bit in my chapter reviews, but ever since we were introduced to Wano's act system, the challenge has been on to decipher exactly how many acts this arc is going to be. And in the very early days, there were thoughts of a traditional Western three act story, or perhaps even a more operatic four acts. And on the table was always the most daunting option a five act story, which I've personally been rooting for. And at this stage, I have very little doubt that Wano will consist of five acts. And that might sound a bit strange given that we are currently in act three and it looks like the climax stage of an arc. But if I were you, I really would settle in and prepare for the remainder of the lengthy journey to come. And one way of doing this is just by pressing the subscribe button for the Grand Line Review, which is scientifically proven to lower your stress levels, make you more physically attractive, and even result in regular One Piece content uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. But back to Wano, my thoughts of a five act structure spawn almost entirely from one word, and that word is Kabuki. Wano is very obviously adopting the structure of a Kabuki play, albeit in its own weird and funky One Piece style. And in case you're unaware of Kabuki, it is a hyper-stylized form of Japanese theater, which is actually listed by UNESCO as an intangible heritage, allegedly possessing outstanding universal value. Pretty big words there, UNESCO. Although fun fact, One Piece itself has actually been adapted into a Kabuki play, or more accurately, a super Kabuki play, which attempts to modernize and make the art form relevant again to younger audiences. Kind of like what we do with Shakespeare in the West, or at least kind of what we try to do with Shakespeare. In any case, that One Piece Kabuki play was an incredible hit, and it focused on the Paramount War saga, which is ambitious to say the least, but that is a lot of what Kabuki tends to be, taking on legendary historical accounts with larger than life figures. So I think it's quite cool that we're now experiencing the inverse, seeing the Kabuki art form directly adapted into One Piece, not the other way around. And you can see this quite clearly everywhere on Wano, whether it be the traditional curtain opening and closing with each act, the music used, even in the manga, the music is very apparent, and especially when you look at costumes. Many of the vassals in particular take direct inspiration from famed Kabuki characters. In fact, many of the vassals' names come directly from famous lines of Kabuki actors. And this even extends to smaller character aspects like Kiku, for example. She's biologically male, but identifies as a woman, which is very in keeping with the Kabuki style, given that to this very day, all roles are performed exclusively by men. And furthermore, the names of said famous characters have even made their way onto Wano. For example, Zoro and Sanji's Wano names come from a famous play called Kotobuki Soga no Taiman, and it features two brothers named Juro and Goro. Hence why we have Zoro Juro and Sangoro. And every step we take on Wano brings a new Kabuki feature into the mix, but why is all of this relevant? Well, that's because almost all Kabuki plays follow a very common five act structure. And to break things down slightly more or break things up, these acts also follow a common flow known as Johaku. And this in a very, very, I mean, very simplistic sense, I suppose you could consider to be the equivalent of a beginning, middle, and an end, but also not really. Basically, the rundown goes a little something like this. We begin with Joe, which in a Kabuki play encompasses act one. The purpose of this is entirely to introduce the characters in the plot, nothing more, nothing less. Maybe sometimes more actually, in Wano's case, definitely more. Then we move to Ha, which is by far the longest part of the story and spans acts two to four, which are vaguely characterized by big battles commonly occurring in acts two and four, whilst act three is where a particularly tragic event or events happen. It's the emotional low of the piece, or I suppose emotional high, depending on how you view it. And then finally, we have Q, by far the shortest aspect, which is a swift conclusion with Act 5. And I should say that Joha Q is not a formula exclusively applied to Kabuki plays, or in fact, theater in general. Joha Q is also applied to anything and everything in Japan, such as music, martial arts, yoga, painting, tea ceremony, anything, give me anything, and you can Joha Q it. It is incredibly versatile. But also before we dive into laying out the floor plan of the Wano arc, I also think it's very important to note that a five act structure is nothing new to One Piece. And to look at this, we can go back to Dress Rosa. Act one, we arrive on the island of love, passion, and toys. We're introduced to all of the major characters, such as the Don Quixote family, Fujitora, and the strange citizens of Dress Rosa. We're also given the general premise and call to action with the ultimate goal of beating Doflamingo, but we're also introducing stuff like Ace's Devil Fruit to entice Luffy, and act one essentially ends with Luffy deciding to compete in the Corridor Coliseum. And that setup paves the way for act two, which is characterized in the traditional manner via battles, the most obvious being the Coliseum tournament, but this is also where the rest of our protagonists kick into gear, such as Law facing off against Fujitora and Doflamingo. And it ultimately ends with Usopp's quote unquote, defeat of Sugar, which reverts all of the toys to their regular forms. Which gives us act three, beginning with an uprising on Dressrosa as all of our key characters come together in a combined effort to take down Doflamingo, which sees an all out war begin in the country and leads into Trafalgar Law's flashback. The tragic conclusion of which triggers the end of act three. Then moving into act four, this is where all the serious action plays out. The members of the Don Quixote family fall one by one and we have the climactic battle between 
between Luffy and Doflamingo, along with all of the birdcage related drama. And act four rather predictably ends with Doflamingo's defeat, Gats proclaiming that Luffy was the winner and a wave of rejoicing spreading across Dressrosa. Which leaves us with act five, where we have a swift conclusion to the arc. Stuff like Rebecca reuniting with Kuros, Fujitora's apology to King Riku, the formation of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet, and just every thread in the arc is tied together. It's all concluded here in a nice snappy way, and that is a five act story. It's not as clear to identify as Wano, and to be honest, it is arguable where the acts specifically break down. I just went by the major beats, but it is all there. And you can do the same thing to Whole Cake Island as well, but I won't because I really want to talk about Wano, but you can because that's how Oda writes these mega arcs. So let's go ahead and do the same thing with Wano, only slightly trickier because obviously it isn't finished yet. But we have act one, the Joe. This introduces us to the samurai-esque landscape of Wano, the premise behind the plight of the nation, as well as most of our major players, definitely not all. But we end on a profoundly dramatic note with Luffy's defeat and subsequent imprisonment, which sets up act two in much the same way that Luffy entering the Corridor Coliseum sets up act two of Dress Rosa. Very similar situation actually, with Luffy being sequestered to a combat focused area. And act one of Wano took 16 chapters to complete, which is quite a lot for Oda. In comparison, you could argue that act one of Dress Rosa was complete within three to five chapters. But then again, Wano is a much longer story, quite reflective of Kabuki plays, which generally take a whole day to complete the program. Although with that said, rather fittingly, that is more true for the core fabric of Dress Rosa, since the whole arc essentially took place over the course of a single day. In any case, after act one, we are then introduced to the concept of interludes, which I personally believe are the most brilliant idea that Oda has incorporated into this Kabuki play scheme. During those day long features, the audience does take a break to digest and reconnect with the outside world briefly. And I think that these have been a much needed feature of Wano because it almost makes every act feel like an entirely new arc. Whereas with Dress Rosa and Whole Cake Island, for example, the acts blend together and the feeling of fatigue becomes very, very problematic. It's sort of like trying to sit through the entire five acts worth of a day long Kabuki play without a break at all. And here's the fun thing. We've been on Wano for over two years now. This arc began in July of 2018. So actually it's getting close to the two and a half year mark. And it really doesn't feel like it's been that long, at least not to me. Whereas approaching the two year mark with Dress Rosa and Whole Cake Island, I was feeling very, very tired with the general setting and I was quite anxious to move on. And speaking of moving on, let's begin act two of Wano, which actually appears to have been signified during the chapter that ended act one, which was 924 entitled Ha. And if you've been paying attention, you will know that this is incredibly significant considering that it paves the way for the beginning of the Ha portion of the Joe Ha Q model. I will say that the official English chapter is titled Ha, huh, as in H-U-H, which is a reference to the noises the Straw Hats make after seeing the news of Luffy's capture. And in Japanese, this Ha likely has a double meaning, referring to both the Straw Hat reactions and the meta structure of Wano, being Joe Ha Q. But stuff like that is impossible to convey in an English translation. However, Act 2 follows traditional Kabuki standards being characterized by battles. And once again, we have Luffy at the center of all of the action in the Udon prison. But outside, all of the Straw Hats are also engaged in action, like Zoro versus Killer, Sanji versus Page One, both of them coming together to protect Toko, and of course, all of the Big Mom related incidents. It's incredibly similar to Act Two of Dress Rosa in that regard, lots of minor skirmishes building up to a revelation and preparation for an all out assault in Act Three. Which speaking of, from here on out, we will be dealing with spoilers for Wano. So if you're an anime only watcher or just not caught up and don't want spoilers, then uh, sorry, but it does need to be done. So Act Three of Wano commences startlingly similar to Act Three of Dress Rosa with our forces uniting to launch one key attack. However, it would appear to flip the Kabuki model by having the act three moment of tragedy right at the beginning of the piece rather than at the end. So in this case, that profound tragedy would be Odin's flashback, which does satisfy the Kabuki criteria. However, I must stress that generally the events of act three are meant to lead up to and culminate in great tragedy. And the door is well and truly still open for exactly that to happen with our current vassals versus Kaido situation. And at this stage, I think we've already seen the beginnings of it, but I suspect that act three is going to end with their complete defeat and potentially even a death. And that's going to happen probably very soon, bringing the curtain down on the darkest chapter of this Wano play. And that would then pave the way for act four, which is going to be where all of the traditional battles take place, basically doing the standard thing of going from our lowest moment, then the momentum shifting and the tides well and truly beginning to turn, seeing the defeat of the beast pirates one by one and culminating in however Kaido himself gets taken down. And this could take quite a while going by previous examples. I mean, act four of Whole Cake Island was the whole running away from Big Mom ordeal and that was like 30 chapters long. So this will probably be quite an impressive chunk of action, but that doesn't mean it's all it would be. For example, you might even see a Kaido flashback thrown in there. So we have the full scope of his character prior to his defeat. But that is most assuredly how act four ends with an emperor of the sea or even two being taken down. And then we move to act five, which will be wrapping up all of the loose story threads on Wano, such as reinstalling the Kozuki family, resolving relationships and parts forward for the worst generation members, having a 
Marty for Jinbei joining the crew and so on and so forth. There is quite a lot to resolve on Wano, but it will be done in a swift manner worthy of a queue. And I imagine it would be by far the shortest of the five acts. And with all of that in mind, at the time of recording this video, I can't help but feel like we still have at least one whole year left on Wano. In modern times, we tend to average around 40 chapters of One Piece per year, usually just below actually, like 39 or 38. And even with act three's imminent ending, it is so hard to see act four and five being told in less than 30 chapters. Especially when you consider that things like Luffy versus Katakuri took almost 20 chapters to play out. And I don't think that Kaido will be given a lesser treatment than that. But that is our path forward with Wano. Right now we are smack bang in the darkest hour and I would prepare for some grand tragedy, but followed by glorious victory with act four. Although one interesting thought I do have as well is this whole Kabuki model being taken a step further, a sort of Kabukiception if you will. And this is unlikely to happen during this arc, but just a thought for the future. I have this incredible inkling that at some stage, whether it be during a cover story about Wano or near the end of the series, that this whole conflict we're seeing play out right now is going to be turned into an in-world Kabuki play. And we'll see actors on stage in exaggerated makeup representing Luffy, the Straw Hats, Kaido the Vassals, the West Generation, etc. And even if it's only a single panel of a cover story, I would bet quite a bit that this in-world historical event is going to be turned into a Kabuki play. Furthermore, in the real world, I think there's also a very strong chance of the Wano arc becoming another super Kabuki performance. I mean, they tackled Marineford in Kabuki play form already, and the Wano arc is perfectly catered to the format, so really I don't see why not. But yeah, just like the patient audience of any good piece of Kabuki theatre, I suggest that we all sit back, relax, and enjoy the rest of the program because we still have a long day ahead of us. But what do you guys think? Please do leave your thoughts in the comments below or even join my Discord server. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, then please do go and check out some of my other content or even subscribe to the channel for more glorious One Piece business uploaded straight into your YouTube feeds. But for now, this has been the Grand Line Review and I'll see you next time.